So now, let's put this together with a pressure temperature plane. So I'm going to use a, pre a temperature scale going from 400 to 800 degrees centigrade, a pressure scale from zero to one GPA. So we're encompassing all of the crust from the surface to the deepest part of the continental crust and ranges of temperatures appropriate for rocks buried in the earth. Now I can put on that first a set of, of phase boundaries that you should recognize. These are in fact just our luminosilicate phase boundaries. We have a regime of kyanite, andalusite, and sillimanite plotted and we have at each boundary a kyanite to andalusite uh, equilibrium on this boundary, the lower boundary is andalusite to sillimanite, and the far boundary is kyanite to sillimanite. So that takes care of our luminosilicate phase boundary. We've been talking about a quartz muscovite potassium feldspar to aluminosilicate phase boundary, and I plot it here in yellow. And you notice on this yellow phase boundary, you have muscovite plus quartz going to potassium feldspar plus andalusite in the lower corner. Once you move into the sillimanite stability field, it's quartz and muscovite going to potassium feldspar plus sillimanite. And at the upper end of things, it's a reaction to kyanite plus potassium feldspar. Originally, we had for the aluminosilicate phase boundary, a single invariant point. Because of the crossings, we have an additional two invariant points, ones shown with the black circles. Remember from our analysis of the phase rule, we expect five phases at invariant points, and we can count them down here. We have quartz, muscovite, potassium feldspar, and and alusite and sillimanite, all in equilibrium at the lower right phase boundary. Each of the phase invariant points will have five phases in equilibrium. Along the univariant lines, we should have four phases present, and three phases should exist in regions where you can adjust both pressure and temperature. So let's see how that plays out. Oh, and all of this, I'll remind you, is implicitly assuming that there's adequate water to allow any reaction that we want to uh, invoke. So now we put in one of our ternary diagrams in the regime of kyanite, quartz, and muscovite. That was the phase diagram we just showed, or the ternary diagram we just showed on the previous page. In this regime, you'll notice that kyanite is the stable, aluminosilicate and it will be in equilibrium with muscovite and quartz. So that means the rock can contain kyanite, quartz, and muscovite. There's three phases and that's what the phase rule says we should have in, in this system. So we're okay so far, but are those the only three phases that could exist in this range? And the answer is no, and let me show you why. Here's the reaction. It's muscovite quartz going to potassium feldspar plus kyanite. Now, if we had an excess of potassium feldspar, you react potassium feldspar with kyanite, you could run out of kyanite before you ran out of potassium feldspar. As a result, as you come across the phase boundary, reacting potassium feldspar and kyanite together to make muscovite and quartz, you could end up not with kyanite, but with potassium feldspar. So again, in this regime, there are three phases that could be present. They could be quartz, muscovite, and kyanite, or quartz, muscovite, and potassium feldspar. You would have one or the other depending on the bulk composition of the rock. Now we can exclude other combinations. For instance, quartz muscovite, potassium feldspar, and kyanite would not be an equilibrium assemblage in this pressure temperature range. It's, it's forbidden by the phase rule. It's four phases instead of three. And you can look at this and say, well, the kyanite and potassium feldspar ought to react with each other to make quartz and muscovite in that range. 
okay, so we draw a red line through that. That is not an acceptable mineral assemblage. Okay, let's move into another domain on this plot. And in this domain, we've crossed the kyanite silimanite line. And as you notice, the only thing that changes is a K goes to an S. We still have an equilibrium going down to the quartz corner. All the arguments that I gave for the upper quadrant apply to this inner quadrant. Now as I move across the muscovite quartz going to potassium feldspar and silimanite, the big thing that changes is we flip the tie line to the potassium feldspar. Now we can go around this plot and fill in every single domain with the appropriate equilibrium assemblage of three minerals. And I leave it to you to work through each of those and check what phases could be present under what kind of compositions. Now, before ending this video, I want to examine what happens if we found a rock that has silimonite, muscovite, and quartz. And the stability region for those three minerals being in, in equilibrium with each other is highlighted in green. Now, that highlighted in green encompasses a pressure range from 0.22 to 0.82 GPA and a temperature range from 500 to 700 degrees C. Thus, finding a rock with those three minerals in it tells you that the temperature pressure regime had to lie in within those bounds. This is great. Now, this is how metamorphic assemblages tell you something about pressure and temperature. And you could imagine, we've only considered four components. We could add additional components with additional phase boundaries crossing through this PT space and further narrowing down where individual phases would be present. But let's assume we had just this simple system with these four components and we have a set of rocks that we've collected in a field area. We've walked across the surface of the earth and collected a rock in location one, and it had three minerals, andalusite, muscovite, and quartz. We walked over to another outcrop and collected a rock containing silimonite, muscovite, and quartz. And we went to yet another location several kilometers away in which Kyanite was found in the rock in addition to uh, the muscovite and potassium feldspar. We could connect these together and say there's a gradation through our field area from low temperature, low pressure conditions to high temperature, high pressure conditions. Now high pressure is a proxy for depth. The deeper you go, the higher the pressures are. This relationship in your field area where you've collected the rocks is called a field gradient. It's the observed relationship and in space between one outcrop, another outcrop, and a third outcrop. But is this a geotherm? Does it tell you how temperatures increased with depth at some location in the past? Well, the answer is it could if all those rocks obtained their maximum temperature pressure state at exactly the same time. However, if there were, was a metamorphic event, event that transgressed through this area and changed temperatures at different times at different locations, then what you see is not how temperature varied with depth, but how temperature varied with time.